Hi guys, my name is Tom, I'm the tech chap, and welcome to my in-depth review of the HTC One M9. On the whole, HTC is taking a if it ain't broke, don't fix it attitude to the M9, which features fairly modest improvements and changes over its predecessor, the M8. But the one component they have considered needed fixing is the camera. I really liked the M7 and the M8 when they came out, but the one feature I did wish they would improve on is the camera, and I think it's one of the areas that has let down the series so far. So it's great to see that HTC has listened and made a change. Note I'm saying change as opposed to improvement or upgrade, but we'll look at later at just what the new camera can do for the M9. Aside from a fairly minor spec bump, including a new Snapdragon 810 processor, there's not a great deal new with the M9. It's definitely an evolutionary product, not revolutionary. In terms of design, I think it's fair to say that the change from the M8 to the M9 here is definitely quite subtle. Um, the evolution from the M7, the M8 and the M9 is it's not huge, but uh, it has progressively got nicer. I think the M8 was quite a big improvement on the M7 with this brushed uh, metal design and that's sort of featured again here on the M9. So it's certainly not a uh, radical departure from the M8. In fact, if you put them side by side, uh, I think you'll have to look at the back in order to uh, really be sure which one you're looking at. They still come with this sort of uh, very uh, tall design build thanks to the sort of double layer bezel here. It still features the two awesome stereo boom sound speakers but the biggest change here which you'll notice is the new camera on the back gone is the duo camera setup of the m8 and this looks a little more reminiscent of the m7 thanks to this new 20 megapixel camera so it's certainly a tool device and thanks to these fairly chunky bezels we get a pretty average uh, screen to body ratio of 68.5 percent but that is slightly up on the 66.7 percent of the m8 so it's an ever so slightly more compact phone but uh, it's still undoubtedly very tall but it's really, really nice to look at, I and mean, we can talk about screen to body ratios and uh, bezel sizes and uh, thickness and weight, which we will, but I think it's important just to just take a step back and uh, really do appreciate the design of this, because in a lot of smartphones, although they are improving, uh, the HTC, since the M7 series, and the, uh, has really sort of been at the forefront of what pe most people consider to be really good design. It is a bit chunky and a little bit heavy. It's 9.6 millimeters thick, so uh, it's got a bit, of, uh, a bit of a heft to it and it's uh, reasonably heavy at 157 grams if we compare that to 152 grams on the Sony Z3 and as low as 138 on the new S6. So it's a bit chunky, it's a bit heavy, but thanks to this gorgeous full one-piece aluminium body, it looks very, very nice. And uh, you, I know I can't stop just uh, shimmering this uh, brushed, uh, brushed metal f effect for you here. It's uh, genuinely very nice to look at. Now in the hand, the M8 was said to be quite slippery, and uh, I would have agreed with that. And this is a little better in terms of uh, being able to hold it well. If I uh, zoom right in here, you can see that the uh, sort of the back casing almost houses the front. And if we uh, get really close, you can see there's a bit of a lip here, which uh, on the one hand uh, is a bit of an interesting design feature, but on the other, it actually does add a little more grip. You get a bit of a, uh, a tapering here, a bit of a lip as I'm running my fingernail along. So that sort of adds to the comfort, adds to the durability, adds to the grip a bit. But also uh, with extended use, I've found it sort of almost sort of stabs into your fingers a little bit. It's not uncomfortable, but you do start to notice it. You sort of gets uh, really sort of stabs in there a little bit. But it's uh, oh, that's an incredibly minor point. And actually, I prefer the fact that I feel a little more comfortable holding it than uh, the M8. So a lot of people do talk about the bezels, and you know, for some uh, just uh, people just don't care about the bezels. It's a good phone, and it uh, doesn't really matter if there's extra few inches, few centimeters of um, bezel. But fortunately, you know, as I say, they do use them well mo mostly. The top and bottom are. Uh, adorned with the stereo speakers, uh, which the HTC called Boom Sound. We'll talk about the sound quality later, but I will tell you now that these are the best um, examples of the Boom Sound speakers we've seen so far on a HTC device, and uh, by extension, therefore, I believe the best speakers on any smartphone on the market. So that's really a selling point for the device. And, um, you know, a lot of phones do have often a fairly chunky top and bottom bezels, so it's great to see that sort of they're being utilized here with very good stereo speakers. I'd like to see that more on other devices. You know, some people say it's unnecessary, this little uh, black bar here that features the HTC logo. It's obviously not unnecessary, I'm sure HTC designers would love to get rid of it if they can, and no doubt it houses uh, some sensors or bits and pieces, but uh, I don't think 
the good people at HTC are there just to annoy you. I'm sure it's there for a solid reason, but it does add to the height, and you do sort of get this silver, black, and then uh, software button, almost three-tier uh, lower bezel, which just perhaps it looks a, a touch peculiar, but you get used to it, and it's a, it's a minor point. So if we take a bit of a tour of the device, on the right, we have pretty much everything, to be honest. We've got the power button, the volume up and down buttons, and also the micro SD card slot. And also on the left, we have nothing really except the nano SIM card tray. So we've got a nice flush left side, and we've got pretty much everything on the right. What that means is, although the power button, which is the lower of the three buttons here, is easily reachable by your index or uh, thumb, depending on which uh, hand you're using it, I do notice that despite using this quite a lot over the last few weeks, I still do get these wrong. I'm still pressing the power down button for the, sorry, the volume down button for the power, and also sort of vice versa. I'm, I'm getting them a bit mixed up. It does seem a bit odd that you wouldn't place at least one of them, perhaps the power button, or more commonly even the uh, volume buttons on the left side. Uh, so have the, have all these so close. There's a, there's a minor texture dif texture difference. The volume buttons are very sort of metallic, and it's a bit of a uh, bit more scratchy texture to the power button so uh, you can feel the difference if you're looking out for it but on a day-to-day -day basis where you just want to sort of click the power button or click the volume up button you're not really feeling around for textures so you do occasionally mistake the power the volume buttons for the power in addition to all that on the front it doesn't look a great deal different but this is actually now an ultra pixel camera on the m7 and the m8 hcc did use an ultra pixel camera on the back which uh, sort of they hype to be better than megapixels it would be you'd have fewer pixels but they'd be bigger hence the name ultra and so it was supposed to let in more light and offer better photography the uh, merits of the camera we'll go into later but essentially what's happened now is they've moved that ultra pixel camera from the back onto the front so now we get a pretty cool four megapixel sorry four ultra pixel front selfie camera so that's uh, definitely an improvement on the m8 but it doesn't look that dissimilar and obviously on the back we have the new 20 megapixel camera with a dual led flash on the side so aside from that and a couple of bands to uh, allow connections uh, through it's very very similar to the m8 and uh, i think anyone who's used the m8 will appreciate or at least if when you hold this you'll um, be right at home with it whether you prefer you would you wanted a bit of an improvement on the M9 or you were quite happy with how the M8 looked is obviously up to you but this is unmistakably a nice looking device and it's a bit more grippy but certainly we're not seeing a lot of innovation in terms of the design here but as I said in the intro if it ain't broke don't fix it and I think the design and build quality of the M9 is one of the uh, M of the one series uh, entirely is one of its selling points and uh, something that people have really grown to love and appreciate so I agree with them it's a great design it'd be nice if they perhaps trim the bezels a touch more but aside from that, it's a solid looking phone, really, really nice. And um, I think the only thing that looks a little odd is how the top's edge is almost entirely taken by the IR blaster for controlling your TV, for example. It has quite a pleasant, smooth uh, texture to it, but um, it, if you compare it to the Galaxy S6, which has a very, very small uh, IR emitter right here, it does seem a bit odd that they've taken up the entire top uh, edge with it. But obviously that doesn't really matter who's going to be looking at the top. But um, on the whole, a very, very good looking phone. Uh, I think probably one of my favorite looking devices, it's um, comparable, from my friends have said, to the uh, iPhone 6 in terms of just how premium and high class it is. And I promise very soon I will stop shimmering this in the light, but it is uh, it is quite nice to look at. So let's move on to the display, and this section won't take that long because there's not really a lot different. We still have a 5-inch 1080p display, which gives it 441 pixels per inch. So it's reasonably sharp, you're not really going to see pixels or anything, and it's the same LCD 3 technology that they've used on the M8 before. It's reasonably bright at 508 nits, but uh, it's a little poor compared to the Galaxy S6 and iPhone 6, which uh, you can see in this little picture here. So it's still only 1080p, and uh, well, some will say that that's a bad thing because other phones like the LG G3, the Galaxy S6, and the Galaxy S6 Edge all have what they call QHD screens, so that's 1440 by 2560 resolution, beyond full HD essentially, resolution screens. Um, others say that, well, you don't really notice the improvement, it's going beyond what people can see, and it's an, an sort of an unnecessary drain on the battery because obviously the displays do uh, take up a lot of battery and it's one of the biggest components for uh, battery usage. So, uh, whatever camp you're in, it's up to you. All I'll say is that the screen is pretty much the same as the M8, and also very, very similar to the M7. 1080p still, the colors are nice. It's uh, unlike the uh, Samsung phones, it's quite a 
but a, a natural, almost not, not almost cool, but not, I wouldn't just go as far as describing it as cool temperature. It's not too garish or anything. It's a solid display. Viewing angles are reasonable, but they sort of fall behind the touch of the devices. You can see there as I uh, turn this to a bit of an acute angle, you can see that the uh, viewing angles aren't spectacular, but they're they're pretty good. And in uh, in bright days, this uh, struggles a touch perhaps compared to the competition, but it's still all around a very solid screen. So the final thing to say about the fact that this isn't QHD, um, I st I'm still in the camp that QHD isn't really necessary on a phone, especially at this size. It's only five inches, and it would just offer a almost 600 PPI ridiculous uh, pixel density. So now the argument against QHD is that obviously it is battery draining, although to the extent it is is debatable. But as we'll go on to later, the battery doesn't really uh, impress that much. So we're not seeing a great deal of benefit as a result of not going for the QHD screen. So it's another example of the M9 just being sort of more of the same from HTC. It's uh, the, perhaps there are subtle improvements. And if, we, and if you uh, compare it side by side, perhaps you'll see very slight changes. But overall, the display is as good as we expect. It's the same as before. And it's, you know, perfectly good and uh, quite enjoyable to use. So let's get into something a little bit more meaty and talk about the performance of the One M9. Inside we have Qualcomm's latest Snapdragon 810 chip, which is a 64-bit octa-core chipset up from the Snapdragon 801 in the M8. Alongside that we've got 3GB of RAM, again up from 2 in the M8. And inside we have 32GB of built-in storage with a micro SD port which supports up to 128 gigabyte cards. So that's really, really good on the storage front, but a good base amount of internal storage and also an excellent amount of expandable memory. So uh, in a world where we're seeing fewer and fewer flagships phones phones offering um, expandable memory, I'm glad to see that HTC is, has stuck with it and we can uh, enjoy some very large capacities. So how fast is it? Well, it's very, very smooth. It's fast. Everything works well. Like it, it plays all the games and apps I throw at it. I'll jump into a couple of games in a second to show you. And a combination of uh, the Sense 7 UI, which is uh, what the software is running on top of Android here, uh, and a combination of that with the latest uh, Snapdragon chip and also 3 gigs of RAM means that everything is really snappy, really nice to use, and uh, you're not going to notice any lag or response issues at all. It's very, very fast. I always like to start with just looking at a benchmark or two. Uh, whether you appreciate the benchmark results is up to you, but I'll show you in anyway. And on the Antutu benchmark, we see a score of 52,343, which is pretty impressive, although it doesn't quite uh, match the new Exynos processes in the Samsung phones. But again, take with a pinch of salt, and uh, it's uh, obviously not really necessarily indicative of user experience, how a phone scores in a benchmark. But what I will say is that, there's, I've and I did a video on this, is that there's been some issues or some uh, news that perhaps the Snapdragon 810 inside sort of throttles a bit as, as it overheats, as it uses sort of intensive apps. I put that to the test and I ran this benchmark about seven times and I did notice a drop in score from what we have here at about 52,000 52, down to about 43, 44,000. So it shows that perhaps there is a bit of throttling, but it's fairly minor. Um, and I suppose when we're talking about that, it is a whether it's a direct result of overheating, I'm not sure. I have to go f test further, but it, this does definitely get quite warm. Obviously, this is a metal, I believe, aluminium body, and so conducts heat well off the chip. But as a result, you can therefore feel it in your hand, and it can become a little uncomfortable um, in terms of uh, how warm it is. Obviously, now that's just me running benchmarks over and over. Uh, this is less noticeable in the real world, but if you are playing a really intense app like uh, Modern Combat 5 or Real Racing 3, which we'll, I'll show you in just a second, then you will notice that uh, just around here it gets quite warm and uh, you'll perhaps want to be changing your grip every now and then to cool it down. So on the, on, you know, on the plus side, it's keeping the chip cool because it's dissipating through the metal body. On the other hand, it's, uh, you know, you're feeling it. So it's not hot, it's just noticeably warm. And there is a minor uh, reduction for throttling in speed as a result of uh, this, I assume, temperature gain. So, But it's not something you'll really see in the real world. You may lose a, f a frame or two in games, but you won't really notice. So that's the issue about throttling and overheating. Go and check out my website now. I've uh, written a uh, feature on it. It's not really something most people will notice or even realize, But so, uh, except for me telling you now. So beyond the benchmarks, let's uh, just play some games. 
I like to show you uh, Mon Combat and Real Racing. I think they're both pretty good looking games, both quite intensive. And although, to be fair, in most of my reviews recently, pretty much every phone does run them well, it's good just to prove that uh, whatever, the chip, whatever uh, phone we're looking at can run the latest and greatest and most intense, t intensive games. So you also have, you have peace of mind that uh, anything you throw at it will run well and it'll be fairly future-proofed. Now, of course, the benchmarks do say that although the Samsung is a bit faster, uh, this is the fastest uh, chip available on the market from Qualcomm and sort of therefore mo probably the second fastest uh, chip in the world for smartphones. So uh, you shouldn't be under any illusion that this isn't going to handle everything you throw at it. Perhaps the loading times and uh, the frame rate is slightly less perhaps than the uh, Samsung phones, but uh, this is absolutely brilliant in itself and uh, perhaps only side by side would you even notice that. So as you can see, it uh, runs flawlessly. It's uh, I would yeah, it's uh, it's it's good to use. Everything is. It's not getting too warm yet just yet, although that does take a few minutes to kick in sometimes. But uh, overall, nice and fast. As you can see here, frame rate's nice and smooth, responsive. No really hints of lag or stutter, so uh, it handles that nice and well. So let's move on and jump into Real Racing 3. Let's, I'll uh, fast forward this so uh, we can uh, jump right into the gameplay so you can see just how smooth it is. So there we are, it does take a uh, fairly decent amount of time to load, but uh, we're in now, so let's uh, have a look at how it runs. And you can see that uh, it runs quite nicely. Now, I will say that it's not got quite the uh, frame rate, perhaps, that I would have expected. Um, I've just finished reviewing the S6, and I do appreciate this is the HTC review, and this isn't a comparison video, but it's, you know, you can't take uh, a phone in a vacuum. You have to look at it in terms of uh, the competition as well. And I'm noticing that the frame rate is a touch lower. It's not quite as silky smooth, but this is a very intensive app and, uh, not ex uh, and doesn't represent... Um, the fact that it's a touch slower in terms of frames, sort of the general user interface, it's only when you do throw intensive, heavy games at it like this that you perhaps notice a bit of a drop in frame rate, but it's um, still, you know, more than playable. It's really enjoyable to use, and if you do uh, purchase the HTC One M9, then you'll, you can throw anything you want at it, and it'll uh, run it well. So, um, performance, absolutely solid, not market-leading, but excellent nonetheless. Now moving on from performance, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just about the hardware, it's the combination of hardware and software that creates a good, uh, smooth, responsive user interface. And the Sense 7 UI, which is the HTC skin on top of Android, which is running 5.0.2 here, uh, has been a really excellent selling feature of the One series since the M7. Sense is uh, it's not there's no there's not much bloatware. It's responsive. It's smooth. It's fast, and uh, I'm just a fan overall of how oh, the settings menu is sort of um, really easy to grasp. But as, as some other devices make it quite complicated. Everything is nice and simple and smooth, and you've got no problems at all with it. So one of the key things with Sense is that you do get what they call blink feed. If you go to the left of the home screen, you can disable this if you like, but I quite like it. It's a flipboard esque uh, news feed uh, other devices from other companies have sort of mimicked this and the success of the blink feed on the one series so you can you know add in your twitter feed your facebook get news updates and etc and i quite like it i still think it's the best implementation of a news feed a news board a flip board as i say like um experience on a device i think they did it first and they still do it best so a combination of that and the general smoothness that which is carried over from previous devices which were you know, they were flawlessly smooth as well, um, is really great. Now, as I say, it is smooth generally, and you're going to you know, have any problems, but there's a few areas it perhaps you do see a, a bit of a slowdown. For example, if you go to the uh, menu where you can see your recent apps, you can close them individually, or you can press the X at the top to close them all. Let me just uh, open a few more to add a few in the background, like so. Now, if you go to it, as I say, you can close them individually like that, but the X takes just a few seconds to close them all, as you can see. it's It sort of becomes twice that long if you do have a, quite a few apps in the background. And having used other phones recently, as I say, uh, there's sort of no lag 
or uh, sort of loading time there. So it's just a, one of those things where you notice there's a bit of a slowdown. I'll come onto the camera later where there's a bit of a slowdown in HDR processing, which is a, a little bit annoying. But beyond those two sort of things, on the whole, it's very, very fast and responsive. So what's new with the M9? Well, not a great deal. As I say, it carries on the nice, simple, easy to use smoothness of uh, that we're used to with Sense. But the two biggest new features are what they call local localization based icons, uh, which to be fair, I'll, I doubt people will really use, but and also the slightly more interesting themes. So uh, basically the localization just means that depending on where you are, your phone will uh, follow you, track you with either GPS or Wi-Fi, and then you'll change your home screen settings or your um, sorry icons to perhaps the office or perhaps to work. And it takes a minute or two to set up, and to be fair, I just don't see anyone really using it. Obviously, each to their own, of course. Um, but for me, much more interestingly, is the themes. So let me show you that. Let's jump into that. And what that means is if you don't, you don't like the uh, default layout, the default fonts and backgrounds, you can download a few, and, and you can also make your own. Perhaps if you've taken a picture, um, you can use that as a base for a theme. The phone will pick out the colors and the uh, sort of just the... the the theme essentially of that uh, image and um, spread it over your phone. So I've downloaded a few. Let me uh, give you an example. I downloaded this one called Tilt, which is a very dark, very black design. It takes a few seconds, and we have a quite a different looking device. You can see it goes as far as changing the icon style. We've got circles now. Um, the app drawer it's very very dark and black, and uh, it's quite interesting. So let's try another one. Let's go back to themes and uh, excuse me. I and download to, to do another one. Which one did I go for? I thought City looked quite nice. So let's apply that. Takes a couple of seconds. And so the biggest change obviously is just the background. They can do stuff with icons. This one doesn't appear to be uh, a huge uh, change from the uh, normal theme, but it's essentially an extended uh, background, you know, an extended wallpaper that spreads just a bit beyond just the uh, wallpaper, as I say. So it's pretty nice. Uh, you can see similar things on the new Galaxy phones as well, but uh, I think the implementation from HD is a bit better, and also the uh, currently number of themes available is substantially more than the com competition. So if you're one of those people who want to uh, create a new theme, create uh, your own very personalized phone, then I think that's going to be something you'll use um, now and then, and it's quite an interesting feature. But on the whole, I think it's interesting that I am spending so much time discussing. Uh, you know, app icons and uh, wallpapers because there's not a great deal new in Sense 7 uh, with the M9 and obviously the M8 and I believe M7 will also enjoy that update so these features won't just be unique to this device. It's again, it's a minor upgrade, there's a few bits and pieces that are new but it's more of the same and that again is no bad thing necessarily, it runs really well and uh, Sense I've always been a fan of because it's so uh, reliable, apps don't crash very often at all and uh, on the whole Everything is nice, fast, and responsive. So the final things I'll mention about the Sense 7 UI and the overall operating system is there's a couple of neat features you can find in the options um, for motions and gestures. So we go to settings and then scroll down to uh, the display and gestures and scroll down again to motion launch gestures. So it's fairly well hidden. You can enable double tap to wake and sleep and uh, I think quite usefully volume button to launch the camera. So, uh, you know, I can, if I turn this off, I can double tap it like so to wake it up. In addition to that, if you scroll up to uh, personalize, you can actually change what software icons appear on the bottom. So if we go to change navigation buttons, you can add in auto rotate, turn the screen off, hide navigation bar, which I think is quite interesting. So if you say you might want to turn that on, you get an extra button here and you can uh, hide it like so and you can uh, pull it up. So I think that's one thing I, I quite like. I'm not sure whether I want to keep it on the uh, bar here. Perhaps you can make it a, uh, a widget on the home page. But the fact that some people don't like the fact that software buttons do take up some of the screen real estate, the fact that you can add in a uh, button to get rid of that and add in, you know, get your screen back essentially is uh, quite a nice feature. Now let's move on to the camera, and this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. Uh, I think the camera is the biggest change, the biggest, uh, I'm not hesitating to say improvement at this stage, uh, but the biggest difference for sure uh, in the new M9. So as I say, the ultra pixel camera, which we see on the M7 and M8, which was hyped to be good in low light, 
and it was pretty decent. It was good, but it did fall down against the competition. I agree that megapixels are not everything. It comes down to a lot more than that. Software, sensor size, the aperture, etc. But the Ultra Pixel was good and was marketed essentially for being good in low light. And so sensibly, I think they've moved it from the back to the front. So now the front facing camera or the selfie camera is that Ultra Pixel camera. So now on the back, we have a 20 megapixel camera and it's uh, flanked by a dual LED flash and supports up to 4K video recording now and also 1080p 60, although I still recommend just keeping it on uh, normal full HD, which is 1080p 30. One thing it's lacking is optical image stabilization. We're seeing that as a feature on more and more phones these days, so it's a bit of a shame that we don't see it on there. And that's not really the only feature that suffers a bit. It does offer HDR mode, as most phones do these days, but it's not the best in terms of the uh, what sort of picture it creates, and also it's a bit slow. If I go into the settings here, turn on HDR, you can see that it takes a good few seconds to process the shot. And I don't—I hate to mention the competition again, but some of, some new phones um, can do that instantly, pretty much. So uh, there's a bit of a, a delay there, and it's not just the delay that's the issue. I've took a couple of pictures, one with and one without HDR, to show you the difference, and it is interesting just exactly what HDR does do. And this is a picture of me. I was, uh, I was scripting or writing some notes for this review. And I thought I will just take a picture of myself with it. And also this is the picture with it with HDR on. And as you can see, it's far from a natural picture. It uh, is uh, certainly a, a difference. I'm not sure it's uh, particularly better. It does brighten up the dark areas. You can see that the grass in the corner which was created by a shadow is has more detail you can see more of it so that's fair it does brighten things up but what it does to my face and just the overall brightness and color temperature of the uh, photo I'm not a fan of I think it uh, ruins it a bit it makes me look like I've got the sun in my face so it's slow to process and doesn't produce great results so we haven't got OIS the HDR mode is not great and um, it's just sort of uh, not a great start for the camera. Now, obviously, the camera is one thing that I really did want to be improved on this. The M7 and M8 were good, were decent with the Ultra Pixel, but I've been I've been crossing my fingers that HTC would come up with something new and sort of fix it, make it you know um, in the same league as the other phones on the market. And unfortunately, it's not. It's a bit average. Um, there is an update expected for this, which is supposed to improve the rear camera only quality. But I'm reviewing this as is and uh, I think that's fair. Now I went to the Gadget Show live in Birmingham, England uh, a week or so ago. I don't know if any of you saw my video on that. And I had the HTC One M9 as my phone for that day. So let's go through a few pictures which I took. Now uh, first off this is um, a picture of a press room where I was uh, networking obviously and mingling with my fellow ugly uh, journalists. And as you can see it's a decent picture. It's nothing you know, particularly interesting about it, but um, if you zoom in, you sort of the quality isn't there. So it's on the face of it, it's a decent picture. Lighting is is good and the colours are natural. But as soon as you start to zoom in, you do see that uh, loss of quality and detail, which is actually what really the uh, ultra pixel camera suffered with. It was when you zoomed in, you didn't you could see the lack of detail. So let's move on. I did a, a selfie here. So this is a, a look at the front facing camera. I don't know if anyone watches the gadget show. Uh, TV program which airs on Channel 5 in the UK. This is one of the presenters, a, a, a very nice man called Mr. John Bentley. And I was lucky enough to have quick snap a quick selfie of the two of us. And although I don't judge the colours here because uh, it was a purple stage, you can see that this is a, an example of the Ultra Pixel camera, which is supposed to be good in low or difficult light. I was a bit disappointed by it as a camera, and I found in my use of the Ultra Pixel camera that it's just still as perhaps as bad as I remember. Um, so we've got a new technology, a new kind of camera on the back, we've got the old sort on the front, and unfortunately neither are particularly good. They're absolutely fine, they're capable. If I uh, go into this uh, picture with, um, this is a, a nice man called Leon Doyle, he was a former runner-up on The Apprentice in the UK, selling his uh, great product, the Wi-Fi plug. I'm not being paid to say that, I just thought it was a decent product. And um, you can see that the camera... You know, it, it's it's fine. It, everything's fine, and on the face of it, it the colors are decent. And combined with the natural color reproduction of the LCD three display that we have on the HTC, everything looks quite natural. Nothing's oversaturated or or overly vivid, which I do like and I do appreciate. I'm getting the impression that it's a capable phone. 
uh, a capable camera, but it uh, doesn't really stand up to the competition that well. And you can see here, I've uh, took a picture of my uh, camera setup for the show, and it looks, you know, it's focused on the DSLR, obviously, and that looks, you know, fairly good. But again, as soon as you zoom in, the text on the uh, camera is is blurry. It's it's not particularly sharp, and it almost all the background, rather than getting a really nice depth of field effect, you're getting blown out whites. So you're getting um, blur, and whether that's a result of a lack of optical image stabilization or just other issues, I don't know. But you're not getting a particularly pleasant photo overall. Let's give it another chance. So I took this to a National Trust park here in the UK. It's called Stourhead in uh, Wiltshire, I believe. Uh, it's a very beautiful place. If anyone's seen uh, the Colin Firth adaption of Pride and Prejudice, you may recognise it. Uh, I doubt many of you will, especially since 90%, I think, of my audience is male. But it's a beautiful place nonetheless. And this is another example of how the HDR mode makes everything unnaturally bright. You can see here the difference in the exact same picture, with one with and one without HDR. I think you can see immediately which one has HDR and that it just creates a, I'm not going to say bad picture, it's just very different and very unnatural, I think is the best way of describing it. So, if, but moving on, this picture of this of the grass looks, it looks nice, it's reasonably detailed, reasonably crisp, colours are good, and I think that's the one good thing we are seeing is that colours are natural, colours are nice. They're, they're vibrant, but they're not too punchy, and I think that's perhaps one of the best parts of it. But as we go through, whites are often blown out. It can't really take good dynamic range of photos because I can't really utilize the HDR because it creates these really weird pictures. So um, we're getting sort of skies that are blown out and perhaps dark foregrounds. Um, so on the whole, I think it can be summed up by saying that it's it lacks detail, it lacks clarity uh, and sharpness. It's got good color reproduction, a good color temperature but uh, a poor HDR mode, no OIS, and uh, generally just a, you know, a, a lack of features perhaps means it's a bit of an average camera. But that's, and uh, this, this is uh, also visible as on the uh, video side of things as well. As I say, this takes up to 4K video now, but if I show you a, a video, it's decent. It um, is a bit juddery. I'm actually sitting down at this point, so it should be very, very little in terms of uh, judder or um, what's the opposite of smoothness. Um, but, you know, colours are reasonable, as I say. That's what's coming across often. But it's just a bit disappointing that uh, the one thing that I really wished that HTC would improve on, they've not so much improved on, just changed for an equally not brilliant camera. So um, this is one of the areas that is disappointing and will be capable for most, will be functional for most, but when compared with the competition out there, it does fall behind quite substantially, unfortunately. But finally, talking about the camera, it does have a couple of features, something called Zoe, which uh, if anyone's used a one series phone since the M7, you'll, you'll know about. It sort of takes a whole lot of stills and then puts them into a, a burst to almost to create a video image. It's been expanded now, you can uh, find friends on it, it's become a bit of a social networking hub. It seems for HTC, I'm not sure who would actually use it in that way. But what you can do is, uh, even if you didn't take the pictures, uh, when you did take the pictures in Zoe mode, you can add them in to a Zoe mode so you can get a bit of a, a, a movie or a bit of a video of your images. So if I uh, perhaps put these pictures of the gadget show thing on, into a bit of a list, you can see how this works like so. So it's quite neat. It sort of is a shortcut, just, you know, avoids editing if you want to do that. Um, I'm not sure you necessarily want to use their default sounds and music, but you can change it. So it's a nice little feature, which is fair. And also in the camera, in terms of talking about features, you can add more modes. Uh, obviously, we have the selfie mode for the front, normal for the back, and pretty standard panoramas. And interestingly, that is about it, but you can download more. If I go to add, there's, uh, well, a couple more to download if you want to... Uh, expand the feature list of the of the camera. Inside we've got a 2840 milliamp hour battery which is uh, 240 milliamps uh, more than the M8. So uh, we're expecting a bit of a better 
battery life, and I think we do see a slight improvement over the M8, but on the whole, it's still very average. I ran the Geekbench rundown test, which is a good indicator of how uh, long the battery is, essentially. You can see that it took 3 hours and 38 to run down from 100% to 0%. Now, that number doesn't necessarily really mean anything to you, but if I were to say that the Galaxy S6 uh, took 5 hours and 50 to do the same thing in the exact same test, um, it does set alarm bells ringing. Now I think that's a bit severe, I don't think my experience in, in, in actually using the phone does represent that huge gap, that huge uh, difference there. But what I will say is, very similar to the camera, the battery life is quite average. Um, it's a bit disappointing for a flagship, and especially as I mentioned in terms of the display, without the Quad HD screen, we're not getting a benefit of, an extra, of a sharper screen here, perhaps at the expense of battery. No, there's no QHD screen, it's just a bit of a okay battery life. So as with most devices, and as is in the case with this, you'll get a day out of it, a, a solid day, but you'll be sort of down to about 20%, maybe 25% at uh, late evening if you have a solid normal working day out, day out of it. Obviously everyone's use is different, but expect it to, uh, you know, you have to charge it overnight. And although this does offer fast charging, um, it's a bit weird that you need to have a special cable for that, which they don't bundle with it, you have to go and buy one separately. So that does increase the speed of the charge if you were to go and buy one a fair bit it promises HTC promise 0 to 60 percent in about half an hour uh, I tested this it took about in that time it only got to about 35 percent but it's still better than uh, default charging speed and it mitigates a little bit the uh, very average battery life but there's no wireless charging or anything it's just uh, quick charging but you do have to go and buy a bit of an accessory for that and also as we're used to with most phones these days there are a power saving and ultra power saving mode which uh, the Ultra basically just makes it a very basic phone and messaging device, but will give you days of battery, essentially. So I will say that you'll probably be getting used to putting saver mode on quite a bit uh, to uh, extend the longevity of the M9, as it's uh, not great. So, again, it's not bad, and this is, this is a, I can hear myself repeating my this, the same adjectives in terms of the battery as I did with the camera. It's not bad. It will do. It's fine, unless you put it side by side with other devices, not, maybe not even realize it's not brilliant, but it's not brilliant. It's solid, it's decent, it's average. It's uh, not perhaps what I'd hope for out of a 550 plus pound um, flagship from HTC, especially given how little innovation we're seeing elsewhere. As I say, there's no QHD screen here to blame it on. The last couple of areas have been a little bit critical. Uh, the camera and the battery, they've been a bit disappointing, but one thing that is still excellent and still class leading is the sound quality. The M9 uses the stereo boom sound speakers which have been excellent ever since the M7 and in addition to that have implemented some software from Dolby which uh, gives it either a slightly more surround, surround sound experience but also a punchier, better, richer experience. Now you can go into the settings and change uh, what you want, like you would like Dolby software to do. Personally, I quite like the theater mode. It adds a bit of a scale, perhaps, to my uh, to my music. So let me show you. I put some Spotify on just quickly. Um, hopefully, I don't compromise any license issues. So let me show you what this software actually does to the sound. So in the settings at the moment, I have music mode enabled on the Dolby Surround setting. So if I play a bit of Tom Petty, I'll shut up and you can hear the difference. So you can hear that the theatre sound setting gives an extra bit of volume, gives a bit of punch to the music, and I actually quite like having the theatre mode on, and it makes for me the M9 the best phone um, on the market, essentially for listening and playing music from, thanks to the stereo speakers, which are really loud, except as I say, wouldn't go quite to max volume, but they're loud, they're punchy, they're bassy, and also the extra Dolby Audio, which is, to me is one of the hidden, more hidden, but best features of the new M9. Um, is that the theatre mode, uh, for me, although you may prefer the music mode, does add a little bit of something for my music. And I listen to quite a bit of music, and it's not just the loudspeakers it affects, it'll also affect your uh, headphones and Bluetooth headsets. So sound quality, sound volume, 
is really uh, best in class for the HTC. So it's nice to come from having being a bit disappointed, as I say, about the camera and the battery life, to having such a uh, really key selling feature here of sound. Finally, in terms of call quality, uh, it's just as good as the sound quality, I'm pleased to say. Thanks to active noise cancellation from a dedicated mic, uh, it's definitely above average in terms of call quality and puts the competitors like the S6, which I noted have to have pretty average to almost poor call quality, to shame. The HTC really is a lot better in that regard just for simply making calls, which, uh, you know, for a smartphone, one of the most fundamental features is to get it, you know, to get right, is to offer a good um, phone, a good call, a good audio quality, and this really does it well. So it's no surprise that thanks to these speakers and the software and the noise cancelling mic that it achieves very good call quality, but it is uh, one of those extra little things that, although perhaps isn't the most important feature anymore on our, smart on our smartphones, I'm glad that HTC has got right. In conclusion, I really wanted to like the M9 more. It's a shame that a combination of a fairly poor camera, average battery life, and overall just a bit of a lack of innovation this year means that for the fact that it's such a high-end flagship and expensive phone, there's just not a great deal to be impressed about on the M9, certainly that we haven't already been impressed with on the M7 or M8. But it still has a great design, albeit being a bit chunky. It still has really great speakers, best in class, and a combination of the Snapdragon 810 and Sense 7 UI means it's a really smooth and responsive user experience. The M9 is certainly a solid phone, and HTC has a bit of a underdog status, you sort of want them to do well, but you can't review these smartphones in a vacuum, you have to consider them in a sort of real world competitive market. And when you compare this side by side with, for example, the Galaxy S6 or S6 Edge, the M9 does fall behind a bit. So it's a good smartphone, but it does suffer from a bit of a lack of innovation this year, and also extremely strong competition. So that's been my in-depth review of the HTC One M9, I hope you've enjoyed it. If you'd like to find out more, check out thetechchat.com and follow me on Twitter at thetechchat. Please subscribe guys, it really helps, and you can keep up to date with my latest videos. But there's nothing more than to say thank you very much for watching and hopefully see you again soon. Cheers guys!